Coming up on this episode, Stephen Curry's remarkable performance against Serbia in the Olympic semi-finals has further ignited the Great Warriors debate right now. Jonathan Kaminga, the reported asking price on his next contract, could lead to a standoff between his management and the franchise. Plus, a rival team centre that should be Golden State's number one trade target in the wake of missing out on Larry Markkinen. Welcome back to the Golden State with Mates podcast. Hope you're all having a good week. I can't start anywhere else but Stephen Curry's incredible performance in Serbia in the Olympic semifinals on Thursday. I don't have to go through it too much. You know the result. 36 points, 9 threes, leading Team USA back from the brink of disaster where they were down 17 in the second quarter. They were down by 11 still with like 7 minutes to go. Steph had 9 points in the fourth to go with the 17 he initially had in the first quarter. Uh, what had seven points in the last two and a half minutes, had that big go-ahead three with, what, 2.24 to go, and then had the steal and layup about 40 seconds later, and then had a couple of clutch free throws to secure it in the final 10 seconds as well. Look, the again, I don't need to go through the performance too much. It's more so, to me, it reiterates the greatness of Steph where there's only certain elite athletes that can get to a point where us as fans – get the same exhilaration and joy that we've been getting for the last 10 to 12 years while also having that history that suggests that this is not a surprise. Like none of what Steph Curry did in this game was a surprise and yet we still get the same joy and exhilaration out of it as we did 10, 12 plus years ago. And I think that's a special balance that not a lot of athletes necessarily get to. Where you can have superstar, you know, you can have players have big performances on the biggest stage, but there's an element of surprise to it or something like that. Like this Steph performance, I think, reiterates the greatness and the simultaneous feeling of not being surprised while also being overwhelmed with excitement and joy at what this guy can produce. And I think that kind of bears through in just the way he plays as well. There's no one that really plays like Steph, and therefore that brings a, a uniqueness and, again, a joy that is hard to, to emanate um, from the performances of other players. Like, there are plenty of guys out there in the league who put up huge numbers, but there is a difference in terms of the entertainment factor. Like, do you prefer to watch Steph Curry go for 35 points or do you prefer to watch Joel Embiid go for 35 points? I'll, I'll leave that up to you, but I know what I prefer. And I know I'm a Warriors fan, so that, that's easy to say. And Philly fans would go the other way. But just from a general neutral fan's perspective, I think most would prefer to watch Steph. And uh, that's not hating on Joel. Or, and there's uh, and there's plenty. There's, there's really no one. <laughs> there's really no one in the league that can bring the same level of of joy to it, really. And again, the fact that you can have that while simultaneously not being surprised by any performance that Steph produces, it's unbelievable. And so it has reignited the debate of, hey, what the hell are the Warriors doing here? <laughs> In terms of plenty of people taking to social media after the game thinking, how can the how can Golden State look at that performance and think that they need to be protective of their young players and their future assets and, and trying to maintain relevance, you know, five, six years down the track when you've got this guy, one of the best players of all time, and clearly the franchise's best player of all time, still somewhere near his best to a point where he can be the best player on the floor at the biggest stage amid a, like, we got to talk about the context here. We're talking about a game that, had four guys on the floor who were top 20 all time. I saw what I made about it yesterday. We were trying to figure out what's another game where there's been four top 20 guys of all time in a competitive environment, like not the All-Star game. No one cares about the All-Star game. In a competitive environment where both teams want to win, where at least one of those top 20 players is actually on the other team. Like it's in this case, it was 3v1, Steph, KD, LeBron, um, versus Jokic. And for Steph to be the best player 
of those four out on a star-studded court, we know the Team USA, we know the accolades that every member of Team USA has racked up, star-studded team. And for Steph to be, be that good and to still be capable of being the best player on the floor in any environment, again, a lot of people took to social media and you know, stating, what are the Warriors doing here? Why are we? Why are they protective of Brandon Bajemski, Jonathan Kaminga when they've got Steph and freaking Curry? And what are they doing? And this is ultimately the balance and the patience that we need to try and find because I think the, th- the, the two things aren't mutually exclusive. You can be frustrated, I think, and, and this, is, this is my perspective, I'm frustrated that the Warriors aren't fully maximising Steph Curry's, the remaining uh, part of Steph Curry's prime, while I also at the same time acknowledge that this is difficult and that they have tried. They have tried, and you've got to acknowledge that. And you look at the last three kind of big stars that have become available that are you know, realistically gettable for the Warriors. Siakam going back to before the trade deadline, before he got moved to the Pacers ultimately. Sounds like Siakam had no interest in re-signing with the Warriors long-term beyond last season, and therefore why would you give up significant assets for a three-month rental? I can understand why they didn't do that. Absolutely. Now, we can question why Siakam wouldn't want to re-sign with the Warriors long-term and what that means about the franchise. But in terms of, like, should you make a trade or not? Well, no, if Siakam said, I've, you know, I'm going to get up and leave in for agency in three months, then clearly you're not going to make the trade. Paul George, they got Paul George wanting to come, right? They were willing to give him a four-year, $220 million max extension. And the Clippers didn't play ball. It's not really the Warriors' fault in that in that instance. Matt, could they have gone harder with a bigger offer? I just don't think the Clippers wanted to be in in salary cap hell again. I don't think they wanted to take on Chris Paul's contract. I don't think they wanted to take on Andrew Wiggins if that was needed. And how else were they going to get there? Like Paul George was making $55 million. How, like how else was that going to happen? So it wasn't 55 at the time. I think it was 48. But still that's like CB3 and another $18 million or Wiggins and another $20, $22 million. Like... I just don't think the Clips had any interest in that. So, again, you can't blame the Warriors necessarily. And in this situation with Markkinen, could they have got Larry Markkinen for give, you know, giving up Kaminga, Pajemski, Moody, and all the picks? Yeah, maybe. But that's way overs. Like, Danny Ainge was never going to give up Larry Markkinen for anything less than the world. And at the end of the day, we're talking about a one-time All-Star who's never been All-NBA. Like, there has to be a limit of how far you're willing to go for that player. And, yes... You know, there's Steph Curry standing over there saying, I need some help, get me a second star. But again, there has to be a balance to it. You, you've, you've got to still, you can't make just a bad trade for the sake of that. And that's what, and Draymond came out and said that on his podcast. Draymond said, we were going to make a trade. And I told the front office, no, that's a bad trade. Don't do that trade. That will make us better in the short term, but in the long term, that's a bad trade. Don't do it. And so he, even he acknowledges it. And I think from a, a Steph and a Draymond perspective, so long as they see that the franchise is trying to get better, trying to make a major roster upgrade, get a second star or whatever else, if so long as they can see them trying, then I think that's okay. Now, we as fans and analysts, like we can debate how hard they're actually trying and whether they're really, really interested or whether they're actually trying to semi have some interest while saying no we actually do want to keep pods and Kaminga and a couple of our picks like we're not we don't want to go all in and and this is part of the issue probably for the Warriors at the moment is they are still trying to balance both sides of the equation the the short term and the long term but there's no doubt that this Steph Curry performance you know one of the storylines was obviously leading Team USA into the final and and how good a performance it was but it also another storyline was relating it back to to the Warriors and the fact that they haven't been able to make an all-in move that lands Steph a second star because based on that performance, you see you see that and think, okay, here's a guy that can still be a top 10 player in the world, can still be the best player in a championship team if you get him a reliable secondary guy and some solid core rotation pieces around that, you could still be a championship team. 
and it's a bit of a shame. And I think, again, I was having this conversation with a mate yesterday as well who who said that it's just a shame that we're getting to a position where Steph is you know, potentially going to end his career on a mediocre team who's not getting to the deep playoff um, positions that they once did. And I thought about it and I wrote about it and said that, hey, well, this is a situation where this Olympic final against France could be the last time we see Steph on a really, really big basketball stage for quite a while. And that's the that's the cold, hard reality of it, is that this is an Olympic final, huge, huge event, and are the Warriors going to be able to get back to Western Conference finals, NBA finals, that kind of stage anytime soon? Not as presently constructed. And like Draymond's come out and said that, that as presently constructed, they won't enter next season in, in championship contention. And so this is just the reality of the situation. They find themselves, and it's difficult. But again, I, I do think you can be disappointed and frustrated that they haven't maximized Steph's prime while also acknowledging that they've tried at least and that these things are difficult. And it does take, like I, I, I said to a mate yesterday, I don't think, and I think we can all widely acknowledge this, I don't think the league wants to help the Warriors out. I don't think the league, and this being the 29 other teams, wants to be the reason the Warriors get a fifth championship in the last dozen years. I don't like I don't think any team wants to be that. You could argue the Minnesota Timberwolves. The Minnesota Timberwolves gave the Warriors a fourth championship because they made a trade of Andrew Wiggins and Jonathan what resulted as Jonathan Kaminga for D'Angelo Russell. And yes, Kaminga didn't do anything in that 2022 championship season, but Wiggins was the second best player. You could argue that the Minnesota Timberwolves not gave but helped the Warriors to a fourth title. And I don't think, I don't think another team wants to do that. And so I think things are more difficult for the Warriors than they probably are for other teams. So you can acknowledge that it's frustrating, but also it's difficult. And the Warriors are tr- have tried to make moves. It's just that other teams aren't necessarily um, willing to play ball with that. And, you know, in the case of Siakam, the player wasn't even really keen on it. So uh, it's a it's a funny situation, um, but their whole future is obviously going to be dependent on what they potentially do with Jonathan Kaminga. And that's what I wanted to jump into in terms of his contract uh, extension eligibility, obviously, this offseason. Jake Fisher of Yahoo, Sp- Yahoo Sports uh, reporting a couple of days ago now on no cap room that Jonathan Kaminga wants a full max rookie extension, five years, $224 million. Now, I've already seen a couple of people say, well, that's just ridiculous. Like, who does he think he is? I think when you hear that and you see that, that Kaminga wants five years, 224, that's probably the initial reaction. I don't blame him. Let's put it that way. So this is a scenario to me where I I would think it's going to be a standoff and I'd be surprised, I'd be very surprised if there's a deal done before the season starts. And obviously, if he doesn't sign a deal now before the season starts, then uh, he automatically becomes a restricted free agent next off season, which is like, it's fine. It's not, it's less than ideal, but it's it's fine. I just cannot see the Warriors being willing to go up to... Like, they're definitely not going to give him a full max five years, 224. Like, that would be stupid. They're not going to do that. I'd be surprised if they go anywhere near 180, 200. And I'd be surprised if Kaminga's willing to take anything less than, like, 180, 200. And this is, unfortunately, this is simply the scenario you get to when you've got an incredibly talented player who has shown huge upside in the last six to eight months going back to, well, really the start of the year, like January, let's say. Um, but before that, hadn't played um, anywhere consistently enough to be able to fully understand and evaluate who he is as a player. So entering year four, like you look at the guys who are who, who have already signed those max rookie extensions, Kate Cunningham, Scotty Barnes, Franz Wagner, 
for starters, those franchises are in a bit of a different position. Like the Pistons, they're still in a rebuilding stage. They kind of have to give Kate, like form number one overall pick, they have to give Kate the deal. Um, you know, Orlando, not a huge trade for agency destination. Homegrown Franz Wagner, kind of have to do the deal. Scotty Barnes, same thing really in Toronto. And all those guys have undoubtedly shown more consistently throughout their career than Jonathan Kaminga. Um, so you can understand why those those teams signed those guys to that deal. But unfortunately, Kaminga, we're in a situation where we still don't know who he is. Like those other three guys, we kind of know who they are and what they project to be. And I actually think Kaminga could he's got the upside where he could still be better than all those guys. I actually, I, I actually think that like I'm Cade's great, but I'm like, I'm not huge. Is he going to be a 10 time all-star? No. Like, is he going to be a five, six time all-star? Mm, questionable. Uh, like Scotty, is he going to be the same? Uh, Franz. Like, I don't think these guys are genuine, like, super, superstars, best player on a championship team kind of guys. Now, can Kaminga get to that point? Probably not. <laughs> but has he got the upside to be a multi-time all-star? Yeah, I think so. And so I can fully appreciate why he would look at those guys and think, I'm as talented as those guys. If you just give me some runway to continue to take strides, then... I'll show you that I'm more than more than um, capable of producing like a max max player, but unfortunately, the franchise just hasn't given him that leg rope yet to be able to do that, and therefore we enter a fourth year where we're still talk like we're still talking about whether or not he's going to be a starter next season, which I don't think should be a conversation, but it is a conversation because if the Warriors start him and they start Draymond at center, I'll talk about this maybe a bit more in a minute. But you know, you know the issues with the Warriors front court, right? And so, what? Like, I'd be just, I'd be super surprised if there's a deal done. And you know, not only Jake Fisher reporting that the Warrior that Kaminga wants a five year, two twenty four max extension. Um, if you listen to the last episode of the uh, Warriors Plus Minus podcast with the Athletic guys, interesting that Slate Anthony Slater kind of mentioned Josh Giddy, and this is probably where there might be some hope for the Warriors where I think there's a little bit of a, a situation. This really bugs me kind of thing where guys look at other guys get max money and think, well, I'm automatically that guy. And I think it might take another one of the, you know, the 2021 top 10 picks to get something less than the max for maybe JK or, and other players to say, oh, well, yeah, okay, maybe I don't need the max. Maybe I'm more so in line with that player. And it was interesting that Slater mentioned Josh Giddy as a guy who Kaminga might look to in terms of what deal gets done there now in Chicago. And if if there's something upwards of you know thirty million dollars a year, which I'd be surprised if Josh Giddy got that much. But again, Chicago have kind of invested in him from a trade standpoint, so maybe they need to back that up financially. But obviously Kaminga would look at Giddy and think, well, I'm not taking a dollar less than Giddy. So whatever he gets, that's got to be my absolute floor. But that could be a good thing for the Warriors. If Giddy comes in at five years, 130, 140, let's say, maybe it's just under $30 million a year. Again, if I'm Giddy, I'm probably pushing for 30. Maybe it's five years, 150. Maybe Kaminga therefore sees that and he's more willing to sign something around that than necessarily just looking at the full max five years, 224. Maybe it'll take another player taking less than the max for Kaminga and maybe some others to follow suit. What I would do personally, if I was the Warriors, I don't think I'd go a dollar over five year 160. So 160 is $32 million a season. That's probably right now. I just think anything more than that is just way too risky for a guy who we've really got 40 games of data 40 games of data is what we really have on what Jonathan Kaminga can be as a scoring option, as a really, really good NBA player. It's not a huge sample size, right? And this is why I think for both parties, it might be best to say, hang on, let's not do an extension. Let's see what the fourth year brings. And if JK shows 
that he is capable of being the second guy offensively on a team, of being a winning player if he takes a major jump, then sure, here's the max or something close to the max. But until then, we can't do that because he's way too risky. And part of that is the Warriors' fault for not playing JK more consistently over the first three years and not getting enough sample size. It's just the situation that they find themselves. And so I believe there will be a standoff where both parties can't really reach an agreement. And I understand why. If I'm the Warriors, I don't go a dollar over five year 160. And if I'm Kaminga, I can fully understand why you want more than that. So we'll wait and see. Again, I'm happy to prove proven wrong. If we see a Kaminga five year 160 deal or something like that, I think that's probably a good outcome for the Warriors. I do think that the way we view contracts probably needs to change. Like $30 million now isn't what it used to be necessarily. Uh, and so if you can find a middle ground where it's 30, around 30 million rather than, you know, the 40 or 40 plus, then that could be a good outcome. Like I think he can be a very good player in this league. And if you, th- if you think he can be a very good player, then he's, he's well worth $32 million. And I even think at his base, like if you base him on what he did over the second half of last season, I do think that's a $30 million player. If you think, he's slightly worse than that, then that's $20 million. Like, I don't think that $32 million would be overly risky. I think even if he had a bit of a, like, didn't quite take the strides again next season, he's still probably going to get at least, like, some team in restricted franchise would come in with an offer of at least 20, if not 25 million. If you look at, what did, what did Patrick Williams just get from the Bulls? I'm, I'm going to look this up. Sorry. I'm looking this up. <laughs> just to give you an idea of what Patrick Williams uh, just got from the Bulls in Franchi. Uh, five years, 90, right? So five years, 90 is what, $18 million a season? Am I right? Or my maths, my dad was a maths teacher for 40 years, so he'd be disappointed with me there. But um, yeah, $18, $18 million a season. So I got that right. But if Patrick Williams can get $18 million a season, and he's been heavily injury prone and hasn't really shown like what Kaminga showed over the last forty games of last season is so much more than Patrick Williams has ever shown for the Chicago Bulls, in my opinion. So therefore, if Williams can get eighteen million dollars a year with his own team, Kaminga's getting at least twenty five, and again thirty would probably like thirty thirty two could prove valuable for the Warriors. So I probably would agree at that point. Anything more than that? It's just too risky, and it's whether Kaminga's, like, is, yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd accept it if I was Kaminga, but I'm I'm a broke boy in Tasmania, Australia. <laughs> like, $160 million to most of us uh, is a lot of, lot of money, and if you had the opportunity, you'd just lock that in. But I can also understand, do you want that extra $60 million? Possibly. Possibly. It's, and it's not just about the money that you get. It's how you're viewed in the league. And for JK, he probably wants to be viewed alongside those guys that have already signed the rookie max extensions. So it's interesting. The other part of this is also Moses Moody, who's extension eligible. Um, Kendra, Kendra Andrews reported the other day that his um, projected value could sit between 11 and $13 million a season. That would be a steal to me. And if I'm Moses, I'm not signing that. If I, If the Warriors came to me with like, three years 33 or four years 45 whatever four years 50 whatever i wouldn't sign that i would still think to myself and again this is a scenario where the warriors haven't played this guy enough so we're still wondering what he can be if i was him i would take the risk of hey i think i can be worth upwards of 15 maybe close to 20 million dollars a season so i'm not necessarily signing a deal that's 11 to 13 million dollars a season I think that would be a steal for the Warriors. I still believe Moses, if given the opportunity, can be a very valuable rotation player and very valuable rotation players these days, especially young ones with upside, 6'6", 3 and D types. Like They should be getting more than $11, $13 million. Again, Patrick Williams just got $18 million. Can Moses Moody do something to suggest that he's somewhere around Patrick Williams' level? 
and getting $18 million a season, not out of the realm of possibility. That's what I'd be hoping for if I was Moses Moody. I'd be hoping to probably show more than what Patrick Williams has. So this feels like a Patrick Williams hate session. I apologize, but I'm just trying to to um, showcase to people what these kind of deals look like at times. And they shouldn't all necessarily be compared because just because that team made a bad deal doesn't mean that we're going to make a bad deal kind of thing. Um, but still, like sometimes you just pay overs for these guys because you've also got to take their talent and future potential into account. We saw it with Jordan Poole. It backfired for the Warriors. Will they be a bit trigger shy as a result and not necessarily want to go huge on Kaminga because of that? Possibly, but I also don't think... Like, Kaminga to me is has obviously shown less than what Paul did before his extension. But Kaminga, I think, projects as... Like, his floor is probably higher than Paul's just because of his skill set, his size, his ability to be impactful on both ends of the floor. Like, he's got a more of a multifaceted skill set than what JP does or did. And therefore, I actually think there's probably less, even though he's shown less throughout his career, I actually think there's probably less risk with Kaminga, so long as it still comes in around a similar number where it's that, you know, Paul got four years, 128, like around that $30 million range. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be okay with giving that to JK. And if they can get Moody to, for 11 to $13 million per year, I think that's good. I think that's a steal. Uh, so we'll wait and see on these things. Of course, they have to be signed before the start of next season. Otherwise, they automatically enter restricted free agency. We'll wait and see. I'd be, I'd honestly be surprised if there's deals with either player. Again, because the Warriors have just put themselves in a position where they unfortunately haven't played these guys enough and and therefore it's still a question mark on who they are going forward. The last thing I just wanted to mention quickly, so Larry Mark and now obviously off the table, um, want to get into some more trade target alternatives potentially. The one I've kind of landed on right now, who I think you know we saw in the in the report from the Athletic that the Warriors will continue to explore smaller scale deals here over the next uh, couple of months, obviously going into training camp. So you look at this roster. We we speak about the depth of it, and therefore that's a major asset for the Warriors. But the issue is there's still not the optionality in the front court that you'd really want from a roster that is so called deep, right? There is just still a real lack of shooting, and that was obviously the great attraction about Mark, and not just the fact that he's a second star for Steph, average 23, 25 points a game on 50, 40, 90 shooting. It's just, the, it's just as much about the fit and the fact that the Warriors needed shooting in the front court and how that would balance out their lineups and their rotations. And I still think they need to try and figure that out because right now they've got their only seven footer on the roster is Quinton Post, and they're only three point. He's not even on the roster right now, and their only three point shooting threat theoretically is Quinton Post. Now you are not going to be relying on a fifty second overall pick. I'm sorry, you're not. And so the Warriors need to find a different avenue. The Warriors need to have at least the optionality. They don't need someone of Markinen's level who's clearly not you know not just a starting caliber player, but an all star caliber player. I'm not saying they need to get a starting caliber player. They just need to get someone who is a little bit different, who you can plug in um, when you need some extra spacing in the front court. Because right now their options are Draymond, Kaminga, TJD, Looney, Kyle Anderson, none of who are three-point shooting threats really at this stage. Draymond shot 40% last season. Cool, I don't care. Teams weren't guarding him, right? He can do that again next season. Teams still probably won't be guarding him. Kaminga is going to take a long time for him to develop a consistent three ball before teams guard him in any serious way, right? So this is this is the issue for the Warriors, and they still need to figure this out. And Markinen would have been the ultimate answer to those issues, but just because they haven't been able to land him doesn't mean they go away from that. And therefore, like, there's some options out there for them. I think, ultim- like, ideally, maybe you go to the Bucs with Brook Lopez and Bobby Portis. I don't think that's necessarily realistic because... The Bucs are in championship contention. Those two guys are top six rotation members. They're also a team above the second apron. Makes it very difficult to orchestrate orchestrate a trade when they can't aggregate salaries and when they uh, can't take a dollar more in a, in a trade than what they send out. So it just makes it difficult. 
the one guy, the one guy I've landed on just to, to full circle to come back to what I've started talking about. The one guy that I would look at as the Warriors should be the Warriors main trade target right now is Wendell Carter Jr. from the Magic. There's enough speculation, been enough speculation around him, even going back to before the trade deadline, that he could be gettable. Now, how realistic that is, we don't know. But again, there's been enough speculation to suggest that you could call up Orlando and they'd have a conversation with you, I would imagine. Now, whether that leads to anything, who knows? And of course, you know what I said on last episode is the Warriors need to, with these smaller scale deals, if they are to make one, they have to make one knowing that it doesn't compromise their ability to land a, a star level player in the future, right? Whether that is start of next season, just before the trade deadline, next off season, whenever it may be. I think Wendell Carter Jr. is probably the that tier of player where he is the best possible player you could get without necessarily compromising that. And he's in a situation where his value is probably slightly lower at the moment because he had a bit of a down year last season. Numbers weren't as high. Um, and he's had some injury issues over the last couple of years. And so, therefore, maybe you can get him at a slightly lower price than what his actual value as a player can be when he's up and running and what his value specifically could be to the Warriors as he's not Larry Markin, but he's a, he's a, a strong um, starting center who is more than capable of shooting the ball from deep. He's 37.4% from three-point range last season, 35.6%. Not nowhere near the three-point shooter Larry Markin in his. We're not saying that, but he does give you that optionality of having that front court spacing that the Warriors don't currently have. And if you look at some of his numbers, so 11 points last season, 6.9 rebounds, 52.5% shooting from the floor, 37.4% from three, as I said. Year before that, 15.2 points, 8.7 rebounds, 2.3 assists, 52.5% shooting from the floor, 35.6% from three-point range. Just, just an aside on this, this is one of the most incredible things I think I've ever seen in terms of statistics. Wendell Carter Jr. has shot exactly 52.5% from the floor in each of his last three years. Have have we ever seen that? Have we ever seen a player who he's played more than fifty games in all three years, like legitimate sample size? Have we seen a guy shoot the exact same percentage from the floor in three straight years, down to the de- like down to the first decimal? <laughs> That's unbelievable. Um, but that that doesn't really matter. I just thought it was an interesting statistic. Uh, yeah. So he's like he's a player to me who um, could be gettable for a price where it's not a it's not compromising the Golden State's ability to go out and get a star in the future and that he could be a very, very impactful piece for you and specifically for the Warriors and their lack of three-point shooting in the front court at the moment. I, I think that he's a player that could come in and actually wrestle for a starting center role. And if he's not your starting center, um, he probably should be the starting center. And I don't know what that means for the starting lineup. I'm, I, I personally think they should consider bringing Draymond off, off the bench next season. And that would be controversial to some. I think there's a real argument for it in terms of being able to um, preserve his body and not asking him to play starting center for 82 games next season while also having the ability to start Kaminga. Now, you can obviously start Kaminga Green and TJD. There's just not enough spacing there. Your best perimeter defender uh, or primary perimeter defender in Wiggins, you're not necessarily wanting to move him back to the bench, particularly if he has any kind of bounce back season. He's also making $26 million. You don't necessarily want to do that. Oh, but Draymond is also making about that money. So pushing him back to the bench would bring that factor as well. But I think they should consider it. Let me know what you think. Uh, But I'd feel better about it if they got Wendell Carter Jr. And you could say, well, hang on. Now we've got Wiggins, Kaminga, Wendell Carter Jr. starting and then we've got Green and TJT as our backup front court. That would be insane. So I think that would be a really nice balance. Uh, and maybe you feel better about doing that than doing Draymond to the bench and all of a sudden you're starting TJD and Kaminga as your four or five. Very young, very inexperienced, particularly if you're going to add pods to that as well. How, what's Steph going to think about starting alongside three guys that are you know two second-year players and a fourth-year guy who's 21 years old? Probably not going to be thrilled about it. It's why the Draymond thing won't happen. Like Draymond will be starting start at the start of next season. I don't think there's any chance he's coming off the bench. I'm just saying I would consider it. And Wendell Carter Jr. 
to me, he's that, again, that tier of player who could be really impactful while not necessarily compromising. Like, would you have to give up a first-round pick? Probably. Like, I'm, I'm thinking Looney, Moody in a couple of seconds would be my offer. Now, do I think the Magic would bite? Probably not, but it's what I'd be offering, and maybe they – Maybe they think there's untapped potential in Moody that they could kind of dive into. Moody feels like a magic kind of player, kind of long, versatile enough defensively. Could thrive in that system a little bit. They need some shooting. It's obviously why they brought in KCP a bit this offseason. So maybe Moody could play a role behind KCP. Who knows? Uh, if there's any magic fans listening or watching to this, which I doubt there is, let me know. Is that something that would interest? You, Looney Moody in a couple of seconds. Again, unlikely. You'd probably need to throw in a first, and at that point you are compromising what you are um, what you could potentially do in the future if you go on state. But let me know what you guys think, who the Warriors' number one trade target should be uh, now that they've missed out on Larry Mark. And for me, it is Wendell Carter Jr. If you've got any other names to throw out there, let me know in the comments. I can mention them on next episode and potentially go through them. Other than that, I'll finish it up. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, that would be greatly appreciated. You can follow me at POC252. That's P-O-K-252 on X slash Twitter. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. Cheers.